But what's brilliant is they don't understand why the Charlie Chaplin fast forward was funny. They were just like, <laughs> people aren't that fa- I mean, some people are that. <laughs> it's, 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 it's comedy. It's comedy. It's great. <laughs> I thought yeah, I li- it was an ode to Benny Hill to me in a Ooh. sketch with little going forward. But then someone <laughs> like imagine someone was like, dude, I love the Benny Hill ending. And then they had to Google to see if Benny Hill was a Jew. And then they were like, kind of disappointed. <laughs> 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 the ending. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema, because if we keep working, we feel essential. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath will be unable to join us this week, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I'm fantastic, Noah. Hey, you know who's a super talented musical act? No, I don't. Me neither, based <laughs> on this episode. <laughs> <laughs> question will maybe answered next week. Who knows? Also joining us tonight is our special returning guest masochist, writer, comedian, and content creator, Meg Anderson. Meg, welcome back. Always happy to have you on. Hi, guys. Thank you so much. I just remembered that I spent the worst night of my life with Eli Bosnick. Eli, do you remember what night that was? Oh, was yeah. it watching this movie? <laughs> <laughs> that was the second worst night. It was election night. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Eli, is, I'm, I'm a masochist when I'm around Eli. Oh, That's so right. <laughs> what's what's funny is that like you almost spent it with me then too because Eli invited me to spend election night with me, with him and I was like, "Are you fucking kidding me? At the end of this night, Donald Trump might be president." And he's like, "Right, <laughs> yeah. right, you're right. You maybe you shouldn't be around people." Yeah, no, I remember. I was excited to get to hang out with you, and I was like, "Oh, well, mm. I guess I'll throw myself into the river by myself." Yeah, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair. We were in this weird, bougie little apartment filled with like African tchotchkes these people had collected on their vacations. So there was no way Noah wasn't hocking one of these tribal spears into someone's <laughs> chest before the end of the night. So it's a mixed bag. It's a mixed oh bag God. as to whether or not that was a better or a worse night. When I approached the building, I knew the pizza was going to be really good when I walked in. I was like, this is going to be brick oven pie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, well, now that you've reminded us all of something that was worse to watch than the movie we watched today, why don't you tell us what we're going to be breaking down today? Uh, We are watching an episode from the Christian variety show Fire by Night, Uh which is also Donald Trump's HR policy. Oh, well done. Well done. (laughs) I have like five punchlines, for which is also (laughs) Caveman KKK's first idea, Fire by Night. (laughs) <laughs> which is also the title of Anthony Scaramucci's autobiography. <laughs> Fantastic. Which is, <laughs> this is a stretch, which is also from the same author as the children's book, Cloudy with a Chance of Israelites. Ooh. <laughs> yes. Uh, you guys watched the pilot episode of this in November. Um, yep. And I am shocked that Fire by Night did not destroy the entire genre of comedy variety shows <laughs> after this. Because you throw out the mold when you see something like this. You're like, hey, can it, we can never do it again. And then this is the one when I was kind of digging into it just as a reminder for folks. This was produced by the largest mega church in Tulsa, the Church on the Move. And it was made from it was it was a decade long. Yes. They made 91 Jesus episodes Christ. of this show, <laughs> wow. which answers the question, how many ways can you do a racist impression of a Jew? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out. 91. <laughs> and Eli, how bad was this episode? Well, if you love Saturday Night Live. But the only part of it you've seen is the opening credits through your atheist neighbor's window. <laughs> you <laughs> made this TV show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. OK. And so one of the most fun things about watching this, of course, this is the the Christian take on Saturday Night Live. So it's a lot of it's done in skit comedy. And what was so fun about watching this this time is that. I happen to know Meg knows quite a bit about skit comedy. She's done quite a bit of skit comedy. So I have to know, where does this show rank in terms of like in in terms of finished product? Not like, you know, your your buddy workshop and something like we're done with this. We're moving on. It cannot be perfected anymore. Sketch comedy. Where does this rank in terms of what you've seen before? 
I think this defines the genre of we'll fix it in post. <laughs> um, <laughs> which we saw with the incredible sketch of the Rebel Brothers, which I'm looking forward to talking about with oh, you guys. God. Which is, It's just, you watch it and you're like, this is the comedy version of when you take the cake out of the oven too early. And by too early, I mean you didn't mix the ingredients together and just break <laughs> the cake. Oh, I was supposed to crack the egg. <laughs> I don't know. It's in the Lord's hands now. So let's just <laughs> fix it in post. We'll fix it in post. Whew. All right. So is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? I'm going to go with best worst. What's hot segment. So uh, spoilers <laughs> as listeners who maybe listen to the November episode, they have a what's hot in Christian music segment. And uh, again, I won't ruin it, but uh, let's just say. It goes off the rails. It, it, it is not about what's hot in Christian music. Right no, now. it isn't. <laughs> Mine is the best. Worst is the aforementioned Rebel Brothers. Yeah. It is. Mm -hmm. It just is the definition of uncomfy from beginning to end. It's like uh, you know an ill-fitting pair of you know washout denims. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was fucking terrible. It was brutal. It was nice that they put it up front, though, so that we saw what we were in for, right? So like, you had <laughs> no illusions going forward. All right, so I'm just going to go with best worst segues, and the reason it gets best worst in this is because it's skit comedy. You literally need no... This is This entire genre requires no segue. You can just fade to black and start with a whole new skit. We'll forgive you for that, and yet... <laughs> They still fuck that up. <laughs> they sure do. They sure do. Yeah. I want to say as a side note that the use of the term skit comedy as opposed to sketch comedy is totally appropriate. Um, like <laughs> skit is like what you do in drama class when you're like, hey, man, let's just do a skit together to kind of work out the scene. <laughs> But like a sketch is like what actual like what has been. But this is and, definitely skit this comedy is for a sure. Skit. This is a skit. <laughs> all right, all right. So well, thank I've you been, for correctly using that term, Noah. I've been <laughs> pedantically agreed with. That's amazing. Awesome. Appreciate that. <laughs> all right. And speaking of fucking up segues, we're gonna advertisement now. <laughs> Seriously, Noah, another Hot Pocket for dinner? What? I like Hot Pockets. I, I, I know you do, but you need some variety. You need something fresh. Wait, like a cold pocket? No, not a cold pocket. We've been over this. You need HelloFresh. What's HelloFresh? They're America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh lets you skip those trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking fun, easy, and affordable. Wow, I'd love to be able to skip the grocery store right now. Well, HelloFresh offers contactless delivery to your doorstep for easy home cooking with the family. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips so you can enjoy cooking and getting dinner on the table in just about 30 minutes or even 20 minutes with their quick recipe options. 20 minutes? That's fast. Sure is. But isn't that meal delivery stuff bad for the environment? Well, the packaging HelloFresh uses to ship your food is almost entirely made from recyclable and or already recycled content. And according to a study done at the University of Michigan, HelloFresh's carbon footprint is 25% lower than store-bought grocery-made meals. Huh. Okay, but but let's say I want to keep my Hot Pockets, because I do. Um, is, there, is there anything for a more flexible meal plan? There sure is. You can keep your fridge stocked by adding extra proteins or sides like garlic bread to your weekly order, easily change your delivery days or food preferences, and skip a week whenever you need to. Feeding the whole family has never been easier with larger box sizes for more servings and more savings. They sent Anna and I a sample box and the recipes were delicious and easy to cook. Plus, they fit my diet. Really? They sure do. Go to HelloFresh.com forward slash Awful80 and use the code Awful80 to get a total of $80 off, including free shipping on your first box. Additional restrictions apply. Please visit HelloFresh.com for more details. Again, that's HelloFresh.com forward slash Awful80 and use code Awful80 for $80 off, including free shipping on your first box. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Is that a second microwave? Yeah, so when I'm done with the... I like... I really like Hot Pockets. You do.
Okay, everybody, time to write episode two of Fire by Night. This one's going to be about rebellion. Hooray! Just real quick, Q, Q, quick question here before we start. Yes, Meg. Are we sure that night is spelled N-I-T-E? God, Meg, yes. We have been over this. Okay, Okay, yeah, and I'm just clarifying because I thought we were going to spell night like night writer and then fire like F Y R E like how it's cool way to spell. That's too. That's too much. That's too much. That's too rebellious. Okay, Okay. forget it. It's fine. It's a dumb idea. Uh, So for episode two, we have second chapter of Acts as our musical guest. Oh, I thought we had Degarmo and Key. Uh, you know what? We can have both. Uh, we'll just only acknowledge one of them. It's a great idea. Yeah, it's just like their career. Okay, and uh, and for sketches. Okay, I wrote a sketch where it's like, duh, I love rebelling, duh. I also wrote that sketch, except mine goes like this. I love rebelling, duh. I'm an idiot, duh. But just real quick, cuckoo on this. Is it possible that in this show, you can let me include my subtle bit about lynching? Uh, I feel like it's yeah. a comedy goal. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You know what? I think we could use both. We could use both. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, and then I am going to ski race that bitch, Jennifer. Sorry, Dave. Did I'm going to ski you're... race Jennifer and I'm going to beat her. That's non-negotiable. Yeah, okay. Jennifer's the, the worst and uh, it's going to take her all show to figure out how to put on her ski bibs. <laughs> right. Right. Good. Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for the breakdown and we're going to open up on their uh, like, Alive from Manhattan. It's the night after Friday credits, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, the music says everything you need to know about this show because you just keep waiting for the lead instrument and it never shows up. Never shows up. No, nope. <laughs> nope. they, they could not help using slurs around the saxophonist. So they lost the permission. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god he he ended up getting a job with law and order because this is like the rejected version of the law and order <laughs> oh there you go it's literally the grainy shots of the host blaine trying to bribe his way into a gay club i'm not sure you saw that too the guy's got a leather hat and a leather vest and he's like come on man just don't tell anybody what if I clean the bathroom afterwards? <laughs> fine, fine. <laughs> we see a photo of the musical guest, the special musical guest, second chapter of Acts. Uh, the fucking, the main guy there looks like Potato Famine Gallagher. Oh, <laughs> wow. God, you know, it's one of those things. I know they stopped letting unattractive people make music in 1992, and that was for the best. <laughs> but they really, really doubled down on the unattractive people in the Christian music scene. These people, all they look like the... The people the hills have eyes, villagers avoid. Like they don't, <laughs> don't pull over don't, don't if they see second, second chapter, chapter of Acts <laughs> at a gas station. They're like, no, nah, we're going to eat different people. I don't know. <laughs> this is the thumbnail that they would use in homicide detective manuals for. You never would have guessed it was them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he looks just like Gallagher. He, he's hilarious and audience friendly. He's easily accessible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we so we wrap up the credits. We meet our host, Blaine Bardo. Now, if you'll recall, we've already done the first episode of, of this show. His monologue the first time could have been summed up as, this cafeteria food, am I right? So <laughs> how is he going to follow up that powerful monologue? <laughs> yeah, what's better than one mediocre joke? Zero fucking jokes. Zero oh, my joke. God, the man... <laughs> perfected the no liner right <laughs> you could open for him in the poconos noah oh, that would be so good absolutely, absolutely. and do then he, he pitches their ski weekend and look nothing <laughs> will tell you about the audience of this show more than the fact that they're like yeah literally everyone watching this show should come to our ski weekend we have plenty of room for both of our audience members. What's crazy about that ski weekend is that, so that is their original fundraising pitch. And it feels like someone went to, like, got a free weekend in Tallahassee at, in exchange for the condo pitch. And they were like, dude, I just went to the most hilarious meeting in the world. And they're like, let's get on the show. <laughs> You're right. I can't afford not to get it. That's yeah. great. It's good. Bit. I can't afford not to. And then they start off hard and they never relent, reminding you how many ways you could die while skiing. 
Well, okay, so here's the fucked up thing about this is that the ski weekend thing, it wasn't a real thing. That was just their in for this bit. No. No. Yes. No. No I way. Absolutely. No, I can't. I, I don't cannot. Think that's, there that's has not true. To, there's literally no information beyond we're going to have a ski weekend this weekend as a show. There's li- like there's no like sign up at or that's you know write into or call. It, yeah, no, that was just that that was the theme of their comedy thing or the thing that they did instead of comedy was skiing and that was their in. I'm almost certain of that. My whole life has changed. This is not a real because it's it's a sloppy ski weekend pitch, but it's an insane comedy premise. (laughs) Wait a second. Yeah, this this makes me feel differently about things. I don't know. No, I believe that as much as I believe that someone floated to heaven from behind that big rock. You know what I mean? I don't know. He's also going to tease the awesome ending of this episode here. He's like, and by the way, stick around to the end of the show because I'm going to fight a woman. That's right. I'm going to fight a woman. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what he said. Also, never trust anyone who calls a snowsuit bib overalls. <laughs> right? What the fuck was that? Why does he say that? I Hold on. I need to go back to this. You really think it was a bit? I, I'm. <laughs> if it's a bit, then he was like, in the writer's room, and he was like, guys, I got a great comedy premise. We describe a possible ski weekend. I am done pitching. <laughs> yep. Well, no, but yeah, right. Because the the whole thing was like we were we had these, these hilarious ideas for the, you know, ski tips. So we go through this whole little thing where he's got all these somebody drew all of these little things that they thought they were gonna and they, they, then they had the little easel that he threw away, the of all the various humorous rules of skiing that he had. Yeah, I think it was all just a setup for that bit. Oh, that's amazing. See, this that's is amazing. Thing, the whole, this Fire by Night should also the the other title should be Telegraph the Joke. Right. <laughs> so, so like that this is a bit seems like not their style. Their comedy stylings are can you believe that we're doing this? It's like All right, but literally otherwise the the ski weekend was hey, come to our ski weekend. We're not going to tell you where it is or how. I don't know which I like more. I kind of <laughs> like that one too, where they held a ski weekend and then they were all sitting there by themselves with 100 oh, cups of We never even told them what town it was going to be. Oh, in. fuck. I forgot to. <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, where are they going skiing? Like which like I learned Tulsa. to ski in Wisconsin. <laughs> so that's pretty close. It's all bunny hills all the time. <laughs> right. Oh my god, that's incredible. I'm going to live in a world where that is a bit <laughs> that's amazing alright and so we go through this amazingly terrible attempt at humor for a little while and then just out of nowhere he ends it by going like and speaking of skiing here's a biblical reference to rebellion yes he's like uh, guys can I be serious for a second rebelling is just as bad as being a witch <laughs> <laughs> yeah I will say that was the first time in the show that I cracked the fuck up when he says, and I quote, the Bible says rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. See, man, this is this is the kind of stuff. This is the dog man, all this kind of stuff I don't get, because what I do know, according to the book, I do trust is that rebel was Dumbledore's cat. <laughs> <laughs> and rebel, and this joke is so bad that I wrote I and Rebel it. was the original transgendered. Was fucking, I can't even say this fucking joke. Rebel is was transphobic, not J.K. Rowling. <laughs> Rebel wrote those tweets. I knew it. I knew I it. I knew Rebel wrote those transphobic <laughs> tweets because she was rebelling against. That's what it, it is. Here's the other question is. Where in the Bible does it say that? And who are they rebelling against? Is it against Jesus? Is it against the Romans? Like, I just, I can't keep up with the bullshit justification. <laughs> yeah, rebelling against the Romans seems like, uh, seems like they encouraged that. Yeah, it's, it's weird. <laughs> All right, so we wrap up this monologue and then we get our first bit. This is their chubby friend doing his Carl the Pug a Pegacorn voice. Yes. What is Carl the Pugapeg court? What? He's a character I using one of the two voices I do that we put in our ads. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, that was me making fun of Eli's voice work actually. It's a, <laughs> it's a name joke. Meg, I have a, a vital question cuz you taught improv. You were my teacher 
Yeah. Is this character that we have in this bit top 100 terrible characters you have ever seen? This character, the only character that I saw was dumber than this, was in the second sketch of this show. (laughs) (laughs) So it goes, this is number two. The Rebel Brothers are number one. Yeah, well, the three characters in that one, yeah, are are tied for first. (laughs) That's correct. (laughs) That was really, this was really bad. This was, watching this guy was like if a dad tried to teach his kids a lesson, like he's dressed up. I'm a prisoner from New York, <laughs> right? And, yeah. But like he he's trying to teach his kids a lesson about rebellion, but the kids in real life had already been placed in protective custody against him. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, who are you who are you doing this for? Because you've made bad choices so far, and this is just one in a litany of them. Whew. The the tiniest, subtlest moment about this sketch, which is only 10 seconds long, is that he has failed to wrap a box of cigarettes into his t-shirt sleeve <laughs> in a way that is mystifying to me. And I'll think about it every night before I go to bed for the rest of my life. Because what he's done is he's he's obviously folded it once and then applied some sort of twist to the fabric, <laughs> not understanding that a second fold was required. It's I honestly expected him to turn around at the end and just cigarettes come pouring out of the back of his t-shirt. <laughs> this is take 847. <laughs> So, I mean, that's amazing. That's like the, <laughs> that's like the ode to like a bad boy. It's like, yeah. this mm-hmm. is like if, you know, John Travolta from Greece was their version of the baddest rebel that ever lived. Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. Oh yeah. So we get his little skit and then we move on to the skit we've been teasing, the Rebel Brothers, which it it opens up on a photo of two people trying to make a baby stop crying for their first time <laughs> ever using nothing but funny faces and props, right? Yeah. This is like the Olin Mills studio frustrated photographers the moment before they <laughs> yes, exactly. quit their job. <laughs> okay, so I have a theory and then I need to explain what happened as I watched this. My theory is someone saw an eighth of a second of a clip of the two wild and crazy guys sketch. Yep. And that's what they're trying to do. Yes. Okay. You're a hundred percent correct. Thank you. They saw that sketch moments before an object fell on their head. (laughs) (laughs) And then they woke up and said, I came up with an idea that no one has ever done for a sketch. Yeah, well, and they're doing these voices as though they had no idea they were going to be doing sketch comedy today, right? Like, no one (laughs) told them. They were like, fuck, voices? Jesus. One character just changes voices entirely halfway through. Also, this is where we get introduced to their terrible laugh track. Oh, I've never said this before. They deserve a refund for this laugh track. They accidentally bought the sarcastic one. They finish a joke and you can hear like, click. Ah, oh, click. <laughs> I mean, Noah, this this is going to go to your Poconos bit, but it's like the laugh track is so un it's so unfunny. The laugh track isn't even laughing. <laughs> yeah, right. No, the, so the the I feel sorry for whoever's cueing this thing because, like, when, right? Like, when do you even <laughs> right, turn exactly. it on and off? But it is so fucking bad. And and then so these two guys come on and they're doing like. You ever you ever seen like the uncle who doesn't know the difference between a seven year old and a thirteen year old and is kind of scared of kids being asked to entertain the kids for a minute? Yes, they're doing his shtick for like <laughs> three or four minutes. So it took me a couple viewings of this sketch to get the like <laughs> joke of the sketch, because I think the game of the sketch is that in a verbally abusive house of an emotionally violent family of developmentally disabled meth addicted stoners. <laughs> Finding a way to stand up for yourself will get you arrested by two strippers in military costumes. <laughs> it's all right. And you know what? That's a great summary of this sketch. Now, I I have a question about the voices because I watched this in the room with my wife and my mother who was visiting and they made <laughs> Very, very strong arguments that they were making fun of people with disabilities. But I think that was just them being, quote unquote, silly. I don't think they were (laughs) aiming for disability. Well, so here's the thing, though. In in the 80s, just being silly and making fun of somebody with a disability was like one in the same. Totally. Oh, 
Oh. Right? Like, we didn't distinguish between those two things. Your mom was around. She just didn't want to tell you about it. You know, she <laughs> she could have told you that. But, yeah. I mean, this is this is like reach for the stars and you get the moon. This is reach for silly and you get making fun of development lead to <laughs> Oh, that's a t-shirt. Can we get that t-shirt? <laughs> so, please, Angelo. Also, I love that it's the military, right? Why right. not cops? <laughs> yeah, okay, so just to, to just to keep the just to catch the audience up here. So these characters are being rebellious, right? They they they're, they come in after curfew and they cut the tag off of the, the you can't cut the tag off of the cushion tag. They cut that tag off. <laughs> they're so rebellious. And then at the end of the skit, two soldiers come in and arrest them. Yes. Two soldiers. Yeah. Soldiers. And I assume it's soldiers because they didn't have police uniforms. They had military uniforms for their anti communism sketch that got cut even from this. That's the only thing I can assume. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. Or, or then this just occurred to me. They never said w- where this sketch was set. So if it's set in Russia in 1950, then that makes sense who's okay. breaking in the door. All right. Yeah. Or if it's set in any large American city in 2020. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if it's set in Portland. <laughs> yeah. This is set in someone that's like, just wait for 30 years. This joke is going to hit hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and so then, so Blaine transitions out of this skit, right? They arrest the kids for being too rebellious, and then Blaine transitions out of it by sitting on a bar stool going, the Oxford English Dictionary defines segue as, and then he hits us with a Bible quote. Oh. <laughs> it's a, oh, that was fun. Anyway, you'll be swallowed by swords if you don't say what your parents want you to say. <laughs> yeah. Is this the opportunity that we can talk about Blaine himself? Please. He, as the host of this show, is what I like to see. He's like Phil Hartman. If Phil Hartman was like a humorless, coke-addled porn addict (laughs) who had his own show. And so can we talk about the, like, research I did on Blaine, who this guy is? like? Please, because this is so revelatory. (laughs) Yeah, right. We talked about it the first time we went through the the first episode that we did. But this is the kind of thing that bears revisiting. (laughs) So you guys already (laughs) talked about that he started the Kickstarter to push his online ministry to help men affected by porn. Mm -hmm. By porn addiction. Yes. Oh, that's special. Okay, good. Yeah, chopping wood. (laughs) Chopping wood. Yes. I will never get over that he called it chopping wood. (laughs) I'm sure you've joked about this and forgive me, audience, if you already have a side for this. But was it intentional or was it like he was actually chopping wood and he's like, this will be good and no one can ever make fun of this? I I felt like at the time I felt like what, you know, I was in the same space as I was with the whole wax on wax off thing on the Karate Kid movie did he realize it when he made it wax off and 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 then and finally the answer we were given the answer when he made the updated one with jackie chan and turned it to jacket on jacket off you know so okay he was obviously he was trying okay we get it now yeah so yeah yeah i think i think he was in on the joke i don't know it would it would honestly be the first time blaine bartle was ever funny so probably not that's yeah that's fair too so this section is where blaine is going to recount the time he won an argument he 100,000% did not have with oh. a random youth who wanted <laughs> oh <my> freedom. God. <laughs> you know, I was standing around the other day when three young people came up and said, hey, let me set you up for a fucking hypothetical argument later. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is when the three freedom-loving kids came up and said that they wanted the freedom to do whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, however they wanted, right? I always find it suspicious when someone pretty aggressively talks about a group of young people who, quote, approached me. It's like, we know you were out soliciting prostitutes, dude. Like, just stay with <laughs> don't like we get. And then you had this argument with prostitutes. Well, yeah, right. If anyone is going to get into an argument about the Bible with the prostitute he's soliciting, it's Blaine, right? That, this is Blaine. <laughs> Blaine. And you know what? This is another thing. Also, what I love very much is so Blaine then does an impression of the young people, quote prostitutes, <laughs> who ask him questions. But the impression he does is like a really mean impression. It's just kind of like he's like, and they were like, what's freedom? Why can't we be free? Which is 
every wife's impression of their husband. <laughs> uh, I want Finn to do the dishes. Yeah, I'm a bit. It's like, I was like, whoa, Blaine, dude, you're taking it deep. All right. <laughs> Sounds like they just want you to pay the pimp. I don't know. I could be wrong. <laughs> Yeah, but so his his amazing retort here, though, is that, like, he, you know, you can't have freedom because the kid said, oh, I want to be free to do whatever I want, whenever I want. And he's like, yeah, OK, freedom. Like, I, I'm then I'm going to go fuck your girlfriend and punch you in the face. How you like that, bitch? Right. <laughs> Which is like almost literally his comeback. Yes. It's, oh, yes. And it, it, that is like, dude, whoa, that's like the that's like the friend that's like, Jesus, I didn't realize how much crack you smoked, dude. I'm I, okay, like, take him home, take Blaine home. Take Blaine home. Someone get him an Uber. Get him an Uber. Uber pool. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Uber pool. Somebody else has to deal with him. That's actually better. Yeah. <laughs> I love that in his show, in a dialogue that he created, he loses to an invisible fake child. Right? <laughs> he is 97 years old. And in the story he made up, a kid was like, I don't know. I want to be able to do what I want. And he was like, oh, rape someone. What? <laughs> Why? How is it's that so my very, counter? I mean, this is just like, uh, this is the first of several examples that he gives of what, quote, freedom and rebellion is. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Dude, they're probably talking about like, hey, like I want to be able to like make my own decisions about who, you know, what clothes I wear, who I spend time with or where I go. And they're like, you want to do some date rape? You want me to yeah. do that? <laughs> <laughs> right. right. No one said that. <laughs> Blade, you brought that up all unsolicited, <laughs> man. <laughs> Every time we talk, you bring up date rape and violence. Do you have a, you should talk to someone, Blaine. You should kickstart this. <laughs> you need to kickstart this. All right. So, and, and now is the time on fire by night when we dance, apparently. This is the second chapter of Axe Music Break, the first of two oh. second chapter of Axe songs we have to sit through. And listener, this is on YouTube. You should absolutely watch this musical number. But just in case you're in a car and you want to know what these people look like, it's the photos of your mom in the 80s twice and Yanni. There you go. You just, uh, yeah. you just pictured second chapter. Of His hair is so wispy. It's so <laughs> wispy. It's like a fog of hair. It's like he started to get hair plugs and then explained that he didn't have the money for the hair plugs. So they were like, fine. You get three four foot long strands of hair. Hope you enjoyed those. <laughs> this is the guy who you're like, wait a second, that's not the guy who is addicted to porn? Are you yeah, sure? Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that guy's addicted to porn. Well, no? we don't know that he wasn't, right? It's not wow, like an either true. or necessarily. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't get caught. But if you told me those three people have children handcuffed to the radiators, I would say how many? Right. Yeah, absolutely. No question. No question. <laughs> they fight over like the good radiator, the, the good <laughs> access <laughs> radiator in the house. There's no question. Also, the way they sing was impressive in its insanity because they're was just it? they're holding open their mouths as <laughs> wide as humanly possible. <laughs> so I'm amazed they managed to like. Based on the visual representation, all of their songs should have been like Jaza Sala Ma. <laughs> well, and also let's talk about the song itself too, because it had this fucking all bridge feel to it, right? Like they had gotten into a fight about whose song they were going to sing, and now everybody's <laughs> just going to, when it's their turn to do a solo, they're going to do something from a different goddamn song, and there's some poor organist trying desperately to keep up somewhere. <laughs> that organist grew up, and they wrote the song XLF. <laughs> that is, the music is like awesome though like come on it's my favorite character in this entire performance <laughs> this this musical number caused my wife to yell you aren't queen at the tv <laughs> oh my god so this song is definitely about the same guy that they're all fucking but none of them realize it <laughs> oh that makes the lyrics so much better he gives yeah. me fire. Everybody's singing about because I don't specifically say the Lord like they do in a lot of other songs. Jesus, they're like, he gave me fire. I was like, I think they're talking about Freddie Mercury, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So they wrap that song. The, the fuck, I think the organist quits, right? Because they're all still singing when the music stops. 
<laughs> so they wrap that up, and then they reprise the Muskogee Vice bit that they did on oh, the previous yeah. episode. Oh, they did. Uh, yeah, this, this is, is a running sketch, Meg, just so you're aware. This this had the legs for a third <laughs> yes, episode. Just right. so you're aware. <laughs> well, when you see it, you're like, I need to see more. I want more. <laughs> right, yeah, that absolutely. I want more of this for sure. And I want to talk about the very opening because they do this like bit where it's like, ha ha, they're riding on a motorcycle together and then it stops and Blaine falls off. Except Blaine, the actor, falls off the motorcycle and hurts himself so hard <laughs> and he tries to play it for comedy for about a quarter of a second. But then you can tell he's just glaring with the utmost white hot hatred at the fellow actor who he blames for his very serious injury. <laughs> Well, and okay, so and they're doing a Miami Vice bit here, so that means that for the first time in the show, they have to include an African American, right? <laughs> yeah, who it took me a a couple viewings and close up look. I was like, is that a guy in blackface? Right, you <laughs> had to ask. I, I didn't trust it, but then I was like, okay, I think it this this is someone who is actually not in blackface. <laughs> and so I should point out to the audience that normally it's really we normally avoid doing bad comedy on God awful movies because it's hard to describe bad comedy in a way that's funny. Right. Because yeah. you're describing how funny it isn't. This show is such an exception to that rule because where they try to get their humor is stuff like why those hats are far too big to be practical. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 At best. At best. Usually their comedy source is just like. Remember, this is like a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that they can't cuss and stuff, but is being funny a sin? I don't understand <laughs> it. Yes, it is. And, and and it's funny because it's like I keep I kept thinking of like, who's the audience? So this is the audience they're still trying to convince to go on a ski weekend, right? <laughs> like, this is the audience who they've duped into thinking a ski weekend is possible in February. <laughs> and they're all based in like, they would think that an Oki from Muskogee joke is fun. This is the same crowd that protested Vietnam protesters. And they were like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Merle Haggard was correct. <laughs> <laughs> Now I have an alternate take, which is maybe Muskegee Vice is totally serious cop show to them. <laughs> oh, my God. They're like, when did this become a drama? I don't understand. <laughs> but I'm loving it. <laughs> well, so the interesting thing, though, is that the intended audience is kids in a church who aren't allowed to leave. <laughs> right. Like, and, and that's what they're doing. Basically, what they're trying to sell. So, so they're not trying to sell the kids that are watching it. They're trying to sell the adults that are going to make the kids watch it. Right. So what they're going to do is they're going to put a bunch of prayers and bullshit in there to make the religious people happy. And they're going to be like, and funny heads and shit. Right. Kids love yeah. funny heads. <laughs> and that's good enough, apparently, for 91 episodes. 91. Look, if the only time you talk to your kid is when you hit them, oh, you're Jesus probably think Christ. the kids like funny hands. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Just saying. If by hit, you mean love. Um, <laughs> and they do. I, they do. They love. I love the homoerotic undercurrent of this buddy duo, which... Yes. Mm, it's like front facing motorcycle riding, stroking. There were like cocked guns and like the Don Johnson guy was like, I got unnecessarily wearing like a tight tank top and a diamond mm -hmm. bolo, which I was impressed yep. Yep. that they found. I was like, yep. is, that, is that necessary? <laughs> it is actually. <laughs> it was in Blaine's Rider. <laughs> And, and this homoerotic couple is they've been tasked to arrest a rebellious kid. So we're cutting between them jumping around all silly and stuff, doing their cop bit. And this rebellious kid who, correct me if I'm wrong, is about to punch his mother in the face any <laughs> second. Correct. I feel like they just asked these two actors to improvise rebelliousness, but without specificity. So he's just like, I'll do the thing if I want to. Oh, no, you won't, young man. Tell me to not. I will. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> okay, wait. So if that's true, the, and they didn't discuss what their motives were, the like mom's moment before is like, he stays out too late. And then the like the the Cobra Kai son, who's the yes. Cobra Kai's backstory, his is like, <laughs> I just raped a bunch of farm animals. Because so, like, both of those stories are true. You're responsible for your action. He's a repeat offender. Goat rape, cow rape, chicken rape. This makes sense. This does make sense. So, yeah. So, so they come in to arrest him. And I have to talk about this very specific line here because 
Blaine Bartle, he's playing the Don Johnson character because of fucking course he is, <laughs> turns to the mom and he says, we're going to take him downtown. We're going to change his attitude. We're going to buck him. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. You're going to no. buck him? <laughs> I also... So I believe it is we're gonna book him. Oh, but I okay. very much heard. I very much heard we're gonna fuck him, and I was like, "Fire by night, episode three. You just won me over." Oh my god, I missed that. I missed that. Book him. That makes way more sense. Okay, oh, that's amazing. I guess he was trying to do some kind of accent or something. Oh boy, you know it's really bad when a guy from Oklahoma makes fun of another guy from Oklahoma's accent. <laughs> right. <laughs> <The sham game. laughs> All right. So so they take the rebellious kid downtown and then they have the the scene where they're like trying to break him under the hot lights and everything. They're interrogating him and and they tell him he's going to go to hell for being all pissy with his mom and that doesn't work and they threaten him with spoilers and that doesn't work. Not just spoilers. Spoilers for the end of Rocky 5. Yeah. Yeah, it's already spoiled. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> he says, and this is what he actually says. You forced me to do to you what you should never wish on another human being. And I paused and got ready because this is Christian television program. But yeah, the answer is spoiling the end of Rocky five. Yeah. <laughs> what happened to this guy that that's the worst thing <laughs> that someone did? And then the crazy ending that he had. Yeah, well, it would have been better than the actual ending of Rocky Five. But but what I love here, too, is how quickly they have to get out of this skit, right? Like, they just suddenly realize they have no ending. So one one of the guys says, well, you know, rebellious kid, Jesus loves you. And the kid le is like, you know what? He does shit. I'm sure sorry that I was mean to my mom. This skit's over. Sure is. <laughs> and scene. As someone who regularly writes sketches where all the characters at the end die because I don't know how to write an ending, I look <laughs> down on this sketch. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Did you guys did you guys hear when Blaine was in was asking Cobra Kai? And I say Cobra Kai because the guy who played him honestly looked just like the actor played Cobra Kai. He had a red kind of like Bruce Springsteen bandana and like cut off. Yeah. Yes. Yep, and the same blonde Which is hair. The, yeah. Quote, that's the villain. Mm -hmm. He said, kids who don't lose their attitude go to Detroit. Did you hear him say that? Did he? Ooh. See, I, honestly, 1986, yeah, that makes sense. Detroit was like, it was, it was pretty rough back then. <laughs> I was going to say, that's no illusions backstory. So that <laughs> makes a lot of sense. <laughs> oh my God. Ooh. <gasps> Wait a second. This is the no illusions. This is your, your history. I did oh, beat the shit out of Ralph Macchio back in the day. I will oh say that much. God. It's been a 259 episode con for Noah to tell his tale. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, now that I know that they're going to recycle material two episodes into this series, <laughs> I need to take up drinking. So we're going to take a quick break, but we'll be back in a minute with even more Fire by Night. Welcome to Big Cell Phone Company. Stand over there. Oh. Okay. Um, I mean, there's no one else in the store. Are you going to... Next! Is that me? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, no. Um, I was wondering if you could help me do something about this whopping cell phone bill and all of these hidden fees. Oh, no. We got another one. You're going to switch to Mint Mobile, aren't you? Uh, what's uh, Mint Mobile? <sighs> Mint Mobile provides the same premium network coverage you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because... Everything's online. I mean, Mint Mobile saves on retail locations and overhead and then passes those savings directly to you. Uh, no, I was, I was hoping you could do something about my bill here at Big Cell Phone Company. Oh, uh, let me see. Uh, I guess I could sign you up for a Family Plus plan where you share one cell phone with your family plus their family's family for just $458 billion a month. Okay, so that's the opposite of what I want? I'm oh, looking. okay. Well, you probably want Mint Mobile, because you could cut your wireless bill down to just $15 a month. Wait, hold on a second. $15 a month? Yep. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number, along with all your existing contacts. 
That is so much less than I'm paying you. It is. It really, really, really is. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash cam. That's mintmobile.com slash cam. Cut your wireless bill down to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash cam. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to go to Mint Mobile. See ya. Oh, oh, oh don't, don't go yet. What if I told you you were eligible for a new phone upgrade? Okay, does that mean that you're just going to sell me a new phone at the manufacturer's suggested retail price, but say the word upgrade first? Yes. Then no. Oh, lost another one. Okay, everybody, welcome to Improv for Christians. This is the special course you petition the theater to have over threat of lawsuit. So we're saying yes and. Uh, my name is Meg. And uh, sorry, today- excuse me. Excuse me, Mrs. Anderson? Hi, Mike. Is that, um, you could just call me Meg. Not until we're married, I can't. I'm already married, but. Okay, so, um, can we do improv, uh, without any SE crossed hockey sticks in it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, sure, we don't, we don't have to, um, to reference any kind of, uh, physical, uh, body touching. Oh, and, uh, and drugs, no drugs. Yes. Okay, Alan. Right. Yep. Okay. No. No drugs. No body touching. Totally fine. And, and by that, and we also we want to include, of course, in drugs, we we mean alcohol and caffeine and tobacco use as well. That's a pretty strict definition of drug, but that's okay. Whatever makes you feel safe on stage. That's my goal. And Is it? Can we keep politics out of it? And also, oh, and movies, uh, TVs, and music that isn't appropriate for our audience. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, we're starting to kind of limit things with drug politicians, music, movies, everything like that. Not, you know, really, we're focusing on the funny is when actors tell the truth on stage. <laughs> no, no, we can't do that. What do you think Christianity is? Some kind of free for all? Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, why don't we just do a scene? Mike and Ellen, you're up. Uh, oh, boy, Dave, I sure am hungry. Ah, uh, that that's it. That's literally everything we can talk about. That is it. Yep. And scene. Great. Okay, cool. I think that's it for the course. I think we're for done. Sure. I like the one where you were hungry. <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit. And we're gonna open up in another God, they had no original ideas for this episode. It's another <laughs> reprise. We're gonna open up on another Jerusalem news update, which I'm sure will be more tasteful than the last one. Oh, it's so good. It's like they got feedback that their Jew voices were too broad, so they're trying to pull them back, but they won't <laughs> stop all the way doing them. <laughs> yes. I just, having not seen the pilot, I can't believe that I had to wait this long for a Jew sketch. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we meet our fucking host and our correspondents, fucking Irving Bergenstein, a witsy Jew, right? <laughs> Ned Koppelstein, you mean? And Irving Ravenberg? <laughs> yes. Jesus the characters Christ. that were named that because someone told them Billy Graham's Christian variety show already used the name Jewy McJewface and Baruch a time going to hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, it's so bad. At one point, one of the guys says Oy vey, like a white guy who just got permission from his black friend to use the N word this one oh, time. Uh, <laughs> Oy vey. <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. So the, the idea here is that they're interviewing Jonah, right? Jonah has just escaped from the belly of the great fish, and he's on his way to Nineveh to preach to him about God's wrath. But their correspondent is caught up with Jonah and is getting the, the skinny about that story, right? Mm-hmm. And I just want to throw this out there. These fucking apologists are not sticking to the Bible. It's a fish, not a whale. It's a fish. It's so oh, they God. do both in this. He's like, you know, he got <laughs> swallowed by a giant fish, presumably a whale. I'm like, not a fish, asshole. <laughs> we don't know much, but we know it ain't a fish. Anyway, they're really hitting the joke hard. I mean, they had to like plant little fish to be fish food. And it was like, yeah, I was yeah. less focused on that and more focused on the fact that the interview with Jonah when he came out, 
I had the same verbatim conversation with a crazy person on a downtown A train once. <laughs> <laughs> Did they film that? Did they film me? <laughs> right. And, and that guy also pulled a fish out of the back of his collar at some point and threw it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. God, at one point, the guy says, know what I mean, Vern? It's just like, it's like uh, you're borrowing bits from commercials that are funnier than your skit, huh? <laughs> well, I appreciate the earnest, the earnest reference. Of, you know, as an 80s show, know what I mean, Vern? I was like, you know what? I do know what you mean. And you've got me back in. I mean, I think that's the thing. When they go far out, they hook the kids and they're back. Simpsons is a little for adults, a little for kids. That's what this is, too. Oh, oh I Vern? see. I see. Paving the way. Yeah. So, yeah, and the whole time, of course, like at a certain point, the commentator turns to the camera and is like, well, there you have it. The kind of shit you have to believe to take this book, literally. Whoops. Why the hell did we do this? <laughs> yeah. And the way they're dressed is as if they had just raided the church's Christmas pageant Zoom yep. golly costumes. <laughs> I want to be all the wise men. And they're like, a Dan Aykroyd impression would be funny in this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so we interview Jonah. Then we see Jonah running off to Nineveh in like, you know, Charlie Chaplin style fast forward comedy. But what's brilliant is they don't understand why the Charlie Chaplin fast forward was funny. They were just like, <laughs> people aren't that. Fa I mean, some people are that <laughs> It's, it's comedy. It's comedy. It's great. <laughs> I thought yeah, I like it was an ode to Benny Hill to me in a Ooh. sketch with little going forward. But then someone <laughs> like imagine someone was like, dude, I love the Benny Hill ending. And then they had to Google to see if Benny Hill was a Jew. And then they were like, kind of disappointed. <laughs> like, might be gay, so I should mix the ending. <laughs> It's like, we, we can't. There's so many comedians we can't use, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, okay, yeah, so then we, we cut from that skit to Blaine chatting it up with the band, and I love this so much because the opening line, this is how bad Blaine is, is it, at interviewing, <laughs> the opening line is, wow, you guys have been performing for 14 years, how have you stayed together for that long? And their answer is like, we're all siblings, dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And man, behind the music has nothing on the depression of this oh, thirty-five God. second interview. <laughs> Every word these people say just yeah. brings you into a darker, sadder world. Man, it is really, really a bummer. Well, and also that question from Blaine makes the viewers realize Blaine doesn't know what family is. <laughs> and also he's thinking about porn for the entire interview he's just oh, replaying yeah. a scene that he saw yeah. not thinking sure. about it because the questions well the second question is how do you guys rebel like when the whole episode is about rebelling from their parents and he's like and then, and then potato fam and gallagher is like our parents died yeah and so <laughs> then we stayed together and you're like holy shit you're a fucking monster, Blaine. <laughs> right? Yes. Right. Well, so, and that's how tragic and terrifying the story is, right? Because we start off listening to the older sister who's significantly older than the other two. And she's like, yeah, you know, and you're like, you get the impression very early on that she's a crazy person because she says, and I quote, <laughs> the Lord taught me how to play piano and write songs. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wow, you'd think the Lord would write better songs, but okay. <laughs> and then we learned that like her two younger siblings, their parents died and she had yeah. to take care of them. So these two, you know, seven and five year olds had to go live with batshit crazy Christian older sister who thinks God taught her how to play the piano. Well, I mean, to be fair, that piano teacher now has a savior complex. Because of it. <laughs> And they get so close to accidentally telling this tragic story, honestly, when they <laughs> the older brother's just like, yeah, I mean, our parents died and, you know, she had been married and we didn't really talk that much before we lived with her. So I guess a band is not the worst thing that could have happened in that scenario. <laughs> Shrug, I'm on television. We're going to keep this in the show. <laughs> what if... What if the older sister, <laughs> what if the two younger siblings were like, you said that we were abandoned? Yes. And then the older sister was like, no, you're in a band now. And they're like, <laughs> fuck. 
<laughs> and then, of course, Blaine, with his great interview style, steps in again and he says, uh, so if all of you guys were, I don't know, on a TV show that children were being forced to watch, what would you tell them? Oh, my well, God. Here's what's great. And I thought this question was posed insanely, but it's going to pay off in the best way. He's like, each of you in a sentence or two and no more, just one sentence. One (laughs) sentence is all that you have. What is your message for young people? But again, you only have one sentences to max. And he says that in such a weird way. But then the first lady that answers talks for 75 minutes. (laughs) Right. right. All right. Blaine, I take it back. (laughs) She goes at one point, she's like, don't be afraid of what's inside you. And I wrote, unless it's a vagina, though. And if that's what's, <laughs> and then be terrified of that. Yes, correct. And if it's a vagina. See, for me, when I heard that, I was like, he's talking about what's inside of you is dreams. And by dreams, she means the DNA of strangers in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> and by DNA, she means um, yeah. <laughs> um, of terrible people. <laughs> yeah. So, and then they have to deal with this like kind of awkward thing about how like you know they love freedom because America, America, but they hate freedom because they don't. You know, you're supposed to submit to Jesus. So they try to like get around that by saying, and I quote: "The more we submit, the freer we are." <laughs> yeah. It's like it's like there's a cult. And you've been there for a weekend because you thought you were renting an Airbnb. (laughs) And now, not the leader of the cult, but someone high up in the cult is explaining that the leader of the cult wants to have sex with you and claim his children as your own. That's how they're (laughs) describing Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) And also, I'd like a good review. What? What? (laughs) That's amazing. It's just like, this is where it's like, how can we not have any understanding that the proselytizing is like so obvious and it's so uncomfortable. It's like the the way that they're talking about Jesus is like, he's like, hey, kid, look, I know you've gone through a major tragedy and you're vulnerable, whatever, but uh, I have a higher, you know, status here. Jesus, uh, he wants you to desire. Shh, just let it happen. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Gad is a weirdly needy dude for being omnipotent. But there's a lot of that in there. There's a lot of that, like, are you, God bought you a, a very nice gift, and you didn't even show up, and he had made a whole <laughs> dinner. It's his birthday. I also love, at one point, one of the, one of the sisters says, uh, God isn't the image in our brain. I just, I love how often their definitions of God start with what he isn't. <laughs> right, because they can't actually define what he is and make it make any fucking sense. So they yeah, start I, off with, "Well, he's not a hat, <laughs> God ish." Uh, that's it. Uh, that's what I've got. Yeah, I, you guys are exposed to this, so you're you have a higher tolerance. But to have to watch just this garbage, <laughs> people trying to like convince you that this is the only way to do it is like, oh, just. Uh, <laughs> It made me want to be addicted to porn, so I wouldn't have to think about it anymore. Yeah, Yeah. by the end of this fucking answer, we're all yelling like, Blaine sent a censor to you, (laughs) motherfucker. You chatty motherfucker. (laughs) And then we get a window into what Seth Andrews was banging in his head to in November of 1986 with Eli's Best Worst, the What's Hot segment. Um, oh my god <laughs> i love these album covers and these video clips so much <laughs> oh my god i love the way the big guitar sting at the beginning drowns out their host and they don't know how to fix it <laughs> <laughs> the host is the thumbnail of a rapist on college campuses absolutely no question oh ron lucci and his pre-mullet <laughs> oh <laughs> and let's just be clear because we've seen one of these before the What's Hot segment is supposed to be, here's all the cool music going on in Christian music. He cannot manage it. Instead, he gets about half a sentence into talking about how DeGarmo and Key are getting a little too mainstream. And then he rants about Billy Idol's penis for six minutes and then it's <laughs> over. <laughs> yeah, the pale-faced British rocker. What? Yes. That's the best income lane song you could come up with. Oh my God. <laughs> this is a crew where the whiter the better you know what i mean <laughs> right so, yeah i think that was john lithgow's sermon from the first drop of footloose if you go back <laughs> the what's hot segment is the same 
Oh, God, it was so good. He's talking about a Christian music. He gets two songs in or two albums in or whatever. And then he's like, but, you know, sometimes people think rock is about rebellion. Look at Billy Idol. He's the devil. He's saying naked with a penis, a penis, no less. And then, mm-hmm. the, and then the fucking extra. And then it goes, <laughs> that's what's hot. <laughs> 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 oh god and then as if that wasn't crazy enough fucking blaine cocaine's at us for a minute right oh, yes. we go back to blaine and all, my entire notes <laughs> on this entire little sermon he gives is just dot 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 what <laughs> <laughs> blaine cocaine's at us is gonna be my next mad lib entry for the whole, the whole time and then blaine cocaine's <laughs> He's like, look, I know you're not a bad person, but you are. You should listen to whatever God says. Or don't. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so this is now the second time that he's brought up the examples of what rebellion are. And he has, in the stylings of comedy, he has followed the heightening rule, right? So he has heightened to super violent and inappropriate Kicking mothers in the face and doing drugs every day. Blaine, you need to fucking go to rehab. <laughs> yeah, he, he really did ramp the fuck up compared to the rebellion we've been dealing with up to that point. Like, all he's doing is giving the viewers good ideas. <laughs> You know, somewhere in his house, there was a note card with examples of rebellion, and it was kick mom in face, drugs every day, <laughs> steal girlfriend punch face? Question. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And then it turns, oh God, Jesus, it turns into a sitcom again, in case <laughs> they couldn't get the full hour, so did I. It's time for <laughs> everyone's favorite C-segment of Fire by Night, Family First. And I just want to say, this is where I realized that Family First isn't actually a sitcom. It's just fuck the older sister, the TV show. Like, right. I thought, oh okay, God. yeah. Because the first episode, the older sister, she wants to talk on the phone. And then the third episode, so I looked ahead. Uh, spoiler alert for the rest of the times that we do this 91 episode series. It is always the sister's fault. There's never a reason for any of the other characters in this show. <laughs> awesome. Oh, my God. Wow. Well, this is this is the best worst Sunny D commercial I ever watched. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, we should point out, of course, once again, in case you missed the first episode we did of this. First of all, Blaine is in this as well. He's the the older son, right? The the yeah. he's the uh, the Alex P. Keaton of this show, and also the people playing his parents. Well, at least the guy playing his father is the same goddamn age as him because he's in his thirties. Sure Sure is. This is a weird vent for Blaine's like, I still look like a high schooler needs. <laughs> and it has weakened from episode one where he made everyone insist that he was the captain of the football team. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but he is now the star of a movie. So what's amazing about Family First is we get to watch them punish a woman for ever wanting a thing, a little boy <laughs> who no one will ever pay attention to, and Blaine to live out a series of more and more upsetting fantasies about his youth. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god but you know what I do love a good fake TV opening credits yeah. <laughs> like I will watch 91 episodes of girl not living her dreams because of a like laughy talking to the old kind of phone bit oh man I oh. fucking love that bit also there is nothing like an earnest non-ironic spiky mullet oh yeah amen amen and a apparently Shoe polish beard. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yes, we're talking about dad's beard yep. now. Yes. <laughs> he looks like Christian cinema's first drag king. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's very first attempt. <laughs> Oh my god. I thought he was a professional hobo. <laughs> I thought he was the guy that played the Tubbs character in the Muskogee Vice skit, but he hadn't cleaned his face all the way off. But there no, it was Oh yeah. my god. <laughs> yeah, I can buy that. Also, did you notice that some of the people who were sitting at the table, the actors, had their lines written yes! on notepads? Yes. You sure saw did. That, right? So they lay down and grab it. And that is how Ice T does his lines in Long Order. <laughs> <laughs> this show and Ice T, yep. But I challenge Simpatico. you, to be honest, watch Ice T. He's always carrying a notepad in Law and Order, and it's because he has those lines written into them. Amazing. Google. All it. right. <laughs> 
challenging question. Who yeah. hates Jews more? The people that made this show or, or I see. Oh, my God. I can't, I can't speak to that. Oh my God. <laughs> All right. So then we get a knock on the door and uh, it's AV dork friend Clarence. He's there to to get Blaine. Call me Doug for this bit. Bartle and show him his cool new camcorder, which is going to be like the, the B plot of this episode. Yeah, and after the Rebellion Brothers, I just want to say I really appreciate Clarence's really subtle performance here. <laughs> as <a nerdy> <laughs> oh, is it the same actor who did that? See, he totally no. transformed. <laughs> I like that his nickname was the big man. Oh, I didn't catch that. Yeah, he's like, the Blaine walks in, he's like, what's up, big man? And I was like, yeah, that's an ode to Clarence Big Man Clemens from East Street Band. We we wait a second. Blaine is admitting he listens to rock and roll music. What's next? Porn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jesus. I love that. Like his his dorky friend comes in and says, hey, look, I just got a cheap camcorder. We could make a TV show. And I'm like, this is the origin story, isn't it? We just went there meta. You go. Weird. Although, isn't a camcorder back then? Weren't they like six thousand dollars? <laughs> uh, that one, no, but yeah, yeah, no, I guess they were they were still pretty expensive at that point. He's been selling drugs to Blaine. He's got the extra cash. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Completely. I like that the 25-year-old narc daughter made her dad promise to drop her off at school, but a block from school. And I was like, oh, boy, you know that hobo father's been exposing himself to the cheerleaders. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> He's like, 100 yards is as close as I can get anyway. It's fine. There's no problem. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> that works out for both of us. And just one little thing I want to touch on about this breakfast scene. Son who will never matter, yep. the youngest son. Yeah. He spends the entire scene just roasting his sister and or giving off warning signals of violence <laughs> like the entire time she's like oh boy i can't wait to get a job and earn my own money and he was like fucking whore and they're like oh <laughs> you scamp you scallywag oh yeah i guess i should probably mention that too that seeing as how that's gonna be the plot of the episode here is that we learn at the breakfast scene that um <laughs> the daughter connie is, is got a job interview and she's gonna make her own money now and then she does the, it's the joke about, I got a clerical job, not a clerical job. Yeah. What? I was like, <laughs> Jesus no. Fucking Christ. Again, we're working in a world where I didn't quite hear you is a comedy premise. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. So that afternoon, we learned that Connie got the job. And I just wrote my notes here like, I'm terrified of where this plot line is going to wind up. Like, anytime you see fucking female autonomy. In a Christian production, it's not going to go well. Yeah, it's not. Never. Independence for women doesn't go well in this genre. Oh, God. The mom says, she's like, I got the job. And the mom goes, what kind of people will you be working with? And I'm like, mom, is that a race thing or a Jewish thing? <laughs> it's definitely one of them. It's definitely. It's the strangest question you could ask a child when they reach employment. Hey, I got the job. Not how much does it pay? What hours will you be working? Just like names of who will be there. <laughs> yeah, like what good thing could that possibly mean? <laughs> but is it? But that's what that's the code the Nazis had, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the don't trust Jews code. Yep. It's so yeah, well, there's a lot of that. Yeah, we'll 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 come back to that. But so Connie's like, I got the job. I'm going to go hang out with my friends. Mom says, be back by 10. And she says, fuck you. Yeah. Fuck you. You're lucky. I don't kick you in the face like Blaine would. Uh, yeah. 10. <laughs> I'm sorry. My curfew was like when school ended. So I didn't realize I was going to out conservative this Christian television show. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, it's not as if the mom had like said no. She just kind of like <laughs> complained and then stormed off. And I was like, oh, that is the strongest mother character these kids will have ever seen. Probably. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, OK, so then we cut to Connie at work. And I love this, too, because we never define what the fuck Connie's job is. It's just sort of general jobbing. Oh, and they they very much stole this opening from every sexual harassment training video you've ever been forced to watch. <laughs> they, they just cut the part where he like asks her to sit on the copier for him. <laughs> yeah, like who was that her manager who was like uncomfortably close to her? Like she was sitting and he was standing and like there was a moment there where it was just his crotch. Yeah. And then he <laughs> left and I was like, that 
why isn't that computer turned on? Like she's going to be kidnapped <laughs> and trafficked. <laughs> Yeah, so she just she works at generic office officing jobly, <laughs> and uh, she's sitting there talking to her coworker, and her coworker is like, "Yeah, you know, my parents used to be a pain in the ass too. Then I moved out on my own and rebelled against them, and now, like, I got it made." And this is so wonderful because this is where we get to see what the people who made this television show think a bad girl dresses like, <laughs> yeah. which is. A white sweater and <laughs> nail polish. <laughs> <laughs> but she's got red hair. And you know, yeah, yeah those, those fire crotch by night, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so like Connie learns all about own apartments and she's like, you know what? Darn it. I'm going to incite this incident. Yeah. <laughs> So, so she decides she's going to move in with her, with her coworkers. So she's got to go back home and tell her parents about her independence. And again, dad's got to beat mom at the weirdest question to ask thing. Cause she's like, Hey, I, your 17 year old daughter, am moving out of the house to live with a stranger. And his first question is, she a fucking Jew. You going to live with a fucking Jew? <laughs> yeah, that the is. Fucking first question is, you, or the, it's not even a question. He says, you don't even know if this girl is a Christian. Literally. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Do you even know if she has the correct religion? She could be a filthy <laughs> Jew. I couldn't hear anything over the mullet and the codependency in this. I had to be a parent. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. Well, mom is downright traumatized by this. I'm like, have you guys not considered that at some point she won't live with you? Because at some point she won't live with you. Well, they, they actually work that through on the timeline. He's like, okay, we can only legally kidnap her for four months. Right, and yeah. And mom's like, that's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah, so they decide that she'll have to learn her lesson the hard way. Yeah, dad picks up his bindle and he's like, all right, I'm off to work. Choo, choo. <laughs> Gotta ride the rails, baby. <laughs> Just hoping the cops have wooden legs and the dogs have rubber teeth. Am I right? <laughs> Just a little insider hobo joke we do. All right, bye. <laughs> There's a drag club on car five, so I'm just going to work out a little stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm so far out of the edge of my seat, it's dangerous. So we're going to pause for safety's sake. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell here. Is Connie moving into a crack house? Will Dad smear his beard on camera? Will they remember that this was a sketch comedy show? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the haphazard conclusion of Fire by Night. And now, back to Family First. Hey, Dad, can I go to Kitty's party tonight? I uh, Well, I don't know. Will her parents be there? Oh, I hate you so much. I hope you die at that party. Dad, did you hear what Johnny just said? He's just jealous that Kitty didn't invite him to the party of the year. She's right, Junior. Don't interrupt. I'd like to interrupt your faces with an axe. Oh, Junior, you scamp. I'm going to buy a gun and kill all of you. Uh, Dad, those were two very specific open threats. Are you going to say anything to little Ed Kemper over there? All right, Junior. Head to your room and go play with your gun. Fine. I was going to do that anyways. All right, so um, so here's the thing you need to understand about going to parties, okay? Yeah? You can't go unless you bring Junior. That's not fair. Life's not fair, especially when you're lying in a shallow grave under the interstate. You were made in the image of the Lord. Have fun, you two. Praise be. And we're back. When we last left off, Connie was going to move into a possibly godless apartment. But before we can pick up that thread, we need to check back in with Blaine, who was about to throw a goddamn fit if they didn't put him in front of the camera some more. So if you recall, he and his buddy Clarence have been making a movie for Jesus. Okay. And to give you an idea, again, how bad these guys are at comedy, they start to do the which of us should be billed first on the poster argument, but they realize that they don't know how to do it funny. So they just agree to disagree. <laughs> well, what's amazing is, I guarantee you there were nine takes of this scene where he was like, no, I'm going to be first. And then Blaine used his coke strength to tear his arm off of his body. <laughs> <laughs> so several re, you know, surgeries and a year of rehab later, they were like, okay, so Blaine, you're going to win. Yeah, I am. I'm going to fucking win. 
<laughs> this is also you can you can tell that Blaine needed to win that argument. And that is foreshadowing for what's going to happen at the end when he challenges the skier. <laughs> Spoilers. Okay, so and then the two of them have to they're they're still filming their video, their movie or whatever, and they're like, All right, it's time to film the final scene. And they get this giant rope that's extraordinarily <laughs> thick. And I got so excited. Mm-hmm. And they're using a spotter, which is appropriate. <laughs> Good for them. But I saw the rope and I was like, that is the rope that you use to tie a boat to a dock. Right. Like, <laughs> like they broke onto their uncle's dock. I was like, this is setting the stage for lynching or autoerotic asphyxiation, <laughs> which yeah. is foreshadowing for play. <laughs> or both. Ooh. Yeah. So wait, now, so now we have to cut back over to Connie. She's moved into her her own apartment now. So we get this scene of her late night infomercialing her way through the kitchen, <laughs> <laughs> aka living like Heath. Well, okay, I love that you say living like Heath. I looked at that kitchen and I'm like. Yeah, they didn't have the guts to commit to the mess like Eli and Anna do. <laughs> they like put a ketchup out from the fridge onto the counter and they were like, it's all we can take. Ten, <laughs> nine, shoot the fucking scene, shoot the fucking scene. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, you really see a lot about the this character when she gets really flustered when there's a chair in her way. Yes! <laughs> it's like, Connie, babe, you gotta, you're going to be facing so many other tougher things than this in your life. <laughs> This is the time when you can face that chair that's too close to the fridge door. <laughs> right. That's because they're, they're trying to like set up that, oh, this apartment is just terrible, but they're not going to like fill it with cockroaches or something. So the way that they do that is it's so small. There's a chair in front of the refrigerator <laughs> door. It's like move that fucking table. Problem solved. Right. Yeah. <laughs> eh, give it Christian space work. Not able to move. <laughs> Chair. <laughs> they just didn't get to this Christian space work part of the improv course, the Christian improv course. Oh, yeah. Everybody got huffy and walked out by then. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I was watching this and I was like, this is this, this story of a young girl living on her own for the first time in a house. It's kind of like uncomfortable, you know, sexual things with a roommate. I was like, Lena Dunham wrote this sketch. Because <laughs> this yes. is the first season of Girls. <laughs> <laughs> this is Christian Girls. I've always said that. I've always said that I've always Fire said by Night. <laughs> I've always said that Blaine is the Christian Lena Dunham. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then, oh God, this is so stupid. They have, she gets the phone call from. In her words, the utility company, just generically, yeah. the u- she's like, hello, the utility company. Apparently, they're going to cut off her utility. Damn. Also, she has to, they're doing that thing where characters narrate the thing that's happening, but yes. not talking realistically on the phone. Right. Uh-huh. So she's like, I'm sorry, what? I gave her the money. She spent it on crack? Well, how do you know that? You're the crack dealer. All right, Blaine, talk to you later. Go ahead, Blaine. You know, it's funny. For a group of people who are so hung up on specifics from the Bible, the lack of detail in this comedy routine is <laughs> alarming, I would say. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's well, the important. broad gestures. Yeah, keep in mind that we still don't even know what her fucking job is. <laughs> it's a jobby McJobby job. So yeah. the other thing is, is that when um, the boyfriend, Crystal's boyfriend comes in. Yes. And they have him have the same kind of like, hey, bro, later, dude, which is like, the Rebel Brothers kind of had that, like, what's yep. that, bro? Like, it's like my dad does that same voice when he's trying to be funny, cool guy, dad. <laughs> yep. And I love my dad. My dad's a good guy. But I was like, why did they cling on to that as this is how we're Rebel Talks? Rebels eat ketchup sandwiches. Rebels fuck dudes with mullets. Enough <laughs> <laughs> Roger is a rebel. Yes. Well, I, I'm pretty sure everyone involved with this filming thought that chicks like to fuck dudes with mullets. But yeah, oh, when she <laughs> yeah. goes into the room, the roommate goes into the room and she's like, we're going to be in the other room fucking. So don't <laughs> join us. 
or do. I'm Jewish. <laughs> I love to. Yeah, they come in. They're like, we're going to be in the other room being rebellious and having sex and not caring what the Lord thinks. <laughs> and she slams the door and there's a fucking Ralph Macchio poster on the outside of her door. What? I guarantee yeah. you that came from Blaine's personal collection. <laughs> Absolutely. Blaine's like, do not fucking touch this poster. I will add this and I will remove it. <laughs> All right. So late that night, dad can't sleep. He's in the living room worried about Connie reading through the Bible. I'm like, oh, God, don't look through that book for daughter related <laughs> advice. <laughs> yeah. I wrote, my first note here is when the mom comes in is like, yeah, I was just looking for a reason to kill our daughter in this book. There's a bunch, actually. There's a ton. <laughs> Of really good excuses to kill our daughter. So. <laughs> so, yeah, so they decide that they're going to pray for Connie. And their prayer isn't like, you know, I hope things work out well for Connie in her new home. Or I hope that we can come to understand that our daughter is going to become independent. It's I sure hope she stops this rebellious bullshit. Jesus, make her come home. I hope bad things happen to my daughter. Yep. Amen. I think all of this... <laughs> could have been avoided if the mom had decided to also be a hobo and then they could have been all hobo family together. Ooh. And then, according to hobo rules, you don't have to look for a reason to kill your daughter. No. Nope. <laughs> oh, God. Nope. It's just about the can of beans that you're fighting over. Exactly. <laughs> oh, my God. Also, this is the second time that they've hated on minimum wage jobs. Yeah. Freddie Smith, the prisoner. Freddie Smith, the overacting prisoner, right? He was shitting on minimum wage jobs. And now it's like, well, what, why are we hating on minimum wage jobs? It's like, you only need a little money to be a crack whore. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so, okay, so then we cut from them. We cut over to Connie and she sure can't sleep very well on that leather ottoman, apparently, that she sleeps on. Just <laughs> Oh, and this is supposed to be a serious scene where she's missing her parents, except it's a big leather 80s ottoman, and it is making constant fart noises that are louder <laughs> yes. than her dialogue. So she's like, oh, gee, I can't wait for me to go to the... It's the... I want every... Terrible movie drama to take. I want the entirety of girl transparent. I want it all to take place on an 80s Ottoman. <laughs> what happened to her bed? Why is she sleeping in a bedroom? That's what she agreed I don't, to. Yeah. Right. And so she's sitting around on her farty ass couch and suddenly she screams. There's supposed to be a mouse in the apartment. They couldn't afford a mouse, right? Like, apparently, they couldn't Didn't get rights sweet, to sweet mice. mouse money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but... Oh, wait a second. <laughs> is, is she on the ottoman because Crystal is in the bedroom? Yeah, fucking. Oh, I miss that. Okay, so all right. in the bedroom? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That makes more sense, I guess, anyway. So, but here's the thing about the screamy mouse scene is that they don't show us the mouse. She just is scooting around on her ottoman. She screams right in our fucking ear and then says, a mouse. <laughs> right? It's like, like, let us know so that that scream doesn't take us entirely by surprise. <laughs> also, the roommate busts out of the room at this point and she's like, hey, stop screaming about mice. You're ruining our fucking. <laughs> or are you? <laughs> <laughs> This is also the White Fragility Training Manual video. <laughs> right. It's coming out. So, and then, so of course, she sits back and, and prays that her mom and dad will forgive her for being so rebellious against God and thinking that she was good enough to do something right. And then the show stops and says, hey, Noah, you could put your last interstitial right here. This would be a great spot for it, right? <laughs> and I'm like, Fuck you, show. I'm being rebellious. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so yeah, after their like suggested commercial break, we go cut back to Doug sitting around with his mom and dad, who are again the same fucking age as him, talking about the Connie plot line. <laughs> and he's like, Hey guys, don't worry about Connie. Eventually she'll starve and come home because this is Christian cinema and we don't have a 
her getting used to it or her doing better. It's eventually she will starve and come to you in desperation. Yep. <laughs> oh my God. To which the parents reply, you know what? That's crazy. Your mom and I actually prayed for that last night. We actually asked the creator of the universe to starve our child and make her afraid and sad so that she comes <laughs> back to the house. <laughs> and just as dad says that, wouldn't you know it? Connie walks through the door and wants to move back in. I'm like, yeah, prayer works great when you're a work of fiction. Oh, <laughs> yay. We can have our family orgy again. <laughs> Also, she said, and I quote, things aren't going great between Crystal and I, which is literally how you tell someone you have a crystal meth addiction. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're missing all the signs. Yeah, right. Blaine goes, wait, that's my line. Oh, never mind. Never mind. Never nope, mind. Sorry. Never mind. You got ahead. You're, you're lying. You're lying. <laughs> and they end on a laugh line about how sad she was. And hungry. Like a like a freeze frame of you were hungry and sad. Yes. Yeah, exactly. They might as well like hand her a piece of pie and then slap it out of her hand and end all <laughs> You were starving. And tell her, you'll never have rights. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. <laughs> but we can't end the show just yet because we have the show within the show. Because we have to cut to everybody watching this crappy movie that Blaine and his buddy made for Jesus. And it occurred to me as they're doing that, for the audience at home listening to us, this is a video inside a sitcom, inside a sketch comedy show, inside a podcast. And that's kind of freaking me out. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> but that's what we're watching. <laughs> And apparently the rope is as much as we were hoping for autoerotic asphyxiation. No, it was for the yeah. final scene of their show when the rapture happens and they needed to lift him up out of his chair. Oh, I thought oh. he hung himself. That's what I thought. <laughs> oh, it was for the rapture. Noah, are you sure you didn't write on this show? <laughs> you can tell us, Noah. You're in a safe place. You are I never, really good at this. I never said that I didn't. Um, <laughs> we can get you on Kickstarter, Noah. It's okay. <laughs> I can chop some wood. Oh, my God. I know the funniest guy. But it was like that. And oh, that makes so much sense. Got it. Right. And they were all like, ha, ha, ha. And for sure, like the little kid in the corner is like, that's not how it will happen. <laughs> <Lord> <laughs> Well, what I love, too, is, look, Eli and I have watched something like, I don't know, conservatively, at least 20 movie, Christian movie raptures. Not so a raptures. single one has ever gone to the trouble of actually using a rope to pull someone up. It's just, <laughs> you just walk in and there's a pile of clothes where they used to be, right? This would be yeah. so much more high quality than anything we've ever seen. <laughs> And then, by the way, and so that I guess that show is over, but the show show isn't over because now suddenly we're watching a DeGarmo and Key video. <laughs> this is not the only DeGarmo and Key video I've ever watched, and now I'm very sad. <laughs> <laughs> that goes on the list of like things that you should shame spiral about, Noah. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe I'm reading into it too deeply, but guys. I think DeGarmo and Key fucking hated each other. <laughs> oh. The Abbott and Costello of Christian music. You know how when you watch A Star is Born, you can really tell that like Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga were like really having fun, that there was a solid connection there. Whatever the opposite of that is, that's what DeGarmo and Key have in this music video. Oh, I think you might be right. Um, That's so funny. I did not pick up on that. That's like what they talked about uh, Vince Vaughn and Reese Witherspoon had in Four Christmases. Go back and rewatch yes. that one. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. You know what? Eventually, I'm sure we will. <laughs> oh my God. This was my favorite bit of the whole show. This video? I love this. I love the music video. Yeah, for sure. I love because for me, it was the story of the little ginger boy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this little kid that sneaks into the back of the DeGarmo and Key concert. Yeah. And for me, I was like the character arc of him thinking first that it was like a dirty movie theater. And he was like, fuck, I can't get in. <laughs> and then he found it, wandered his way and he's like, holy shit, is this an Eagles concert? Because that sure looks like a really shitty version of Glenn Fry. <laughs> and then he realized he's, he doesn't. And then he gets fondled a lot by many adults. Okay. Men Thank you so pointing. much for bringing. <laughs> they have the only explanation for this 
is they, the DeGarmo and Key, the band, had a who can touch this kid the most contest. <laughs> oh my God. Because that is the right? only explanation for how much touching they do of this child that we admit as part of the music video, they have never met. Yeah, exactly. He's just some kid. They don't even know whose kid he is. Yeah, he's like the kid who grew up. The kid who was in Dick Tracy grew up and then got abused by DeGarmo and Key in this video. <laughs> in the a music video in front of us. Yeah, it was. Um, I was like, oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Stop. And then, like, I don't know. I thought that it's like I hated the music, but also I was like, nah, I'm totally into this. But if you, you have to not listen to the lyrics, but the music. And I was like... Fuck yeah, like I'm like digging this. And then I was like, is that Brian May? Is he? That could legitimately be Brian May. Why did you let a homeless kid on stage? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, for our for our listeners at home that maybe had this kind of shit when they were growing up, the, the music video we're talking about is from DeGarmo and Key's Destined to Win. In case, uh, which, by the way, gives the show its first opportunity since the Miami Vice dynamic to work an African American into the program. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Or shitty Lionel Richie. Yeah. yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Murphy's Raw outfit. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so then the video like tries to tries to fuck with us, right? Because the whole video is about this little kid sneaking in behind the concert, but then it turns out the kid was at the concert and he was in the front row, imagining that he. Didn't have a ticket, but snuck it. Like, I don't, I don't get fantasizing about getting gang banged by DeGarmo and Key. I get it. I get it. <laughs> I thought we had sort of an inception and it didn't not cross my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one can only assume, and this is a very small, like, bridge to jump, that this is from Blaine's fever dream. <laughs> okay. All right. This is the porn he got addicted to. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but like, also, it's like, if you don't, I mean, because then it blows up and it's like, you have, they have like 50 gospel singers in the background behind them on this stage. And mm -hmm. maybe I just have COVID glasses, but I'm like, oh my God, the germs that are being spread. Right. All on stage. <laughs> I can't unsee it. And there's so many kids on the stage by then. And yeah, oh, it's yeah, not yeah. good. It looks like fucking Paulson County High School all of a sudden. <laughs> yes, it does. And you know what? Whoever shot this music video is going to be suspended and then unsuspended. <laughs> <laughs> and then that person is going to be fired. And then that person will be pardoned by Donald Trump. The yeah, end right. scene. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so that music video ends, and then Blaine comes on to tell us how we're like Jonah because we suck and we should be swallowed by whales. And I love, this is a little biblical insider moment here. He's like, think about all the prophets that did exactly what God told them to do. Isaiah, Jeremiah, et cetera, right? He stops right there. For those who are not in the know, the next of the major prophets is Ezekiel. He's the one with the poop bread and the scroll leading and shit. Funny how they always <laughs> stop right before they get to Ezekiel, right? Uh, you know, prophets, generally. <laughs> Isaiah, Jeremiah, the other ones. <laughs> Jeremiah was a bullfrog and then whatever the other ones are. And just think about the fact that like Anyway, I think the world's probably about to end is a normal ending for this children's <laughs> show. Yeah. Well, so he tells the story, the Jonah story again, and he tells it in such a fucked up way, because first of all, he's like, and boy, I'll tell you what, after Jonah got out of that whale, he was so excited. He turned 600,000 people all to his religion. I can't say what religion it was because it's not <laughs> Christianity and we're not acknowledging that one right now. But and and he says Man, the people of Nineveh were so excited by Jonah's preaching that even their animals fasted. <laughs> That's just starving your animals. Don't. Don't trust anybody who fasts their animals. They're fucking... Um, yeah. That's it. That's the <laughs> right? Although, I did have an awesome vision in my mind. I really wanted them to doodly do to a bunch of Jewish chickens just being like, bark, 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 bark. <laughs> You mean a bunch of a bunch of chickens they put fake pay us on? Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you get it. Pay us and the black hats. They refuse to social distance. Oh, I can see how oh, you can do the rooster and pay us the little thing, the comb. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So oh <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. So obey your parents and starve your dogs seems to be the fucking message here. Wait, oh God, I gotta I gotta point out this line. This is so amazing. This is a question like he's like, you know, a lot of kids these days they've been burned by drugs, they've been or burned by alcohol, they've been burned by and I quote 
doing their own thing in the area of immorality, and that follows up with AIDS and things like that. And um, actual quote. <laughs> they, they came out and said I couldn't say the gay slur in my monologue, so <laughs> I'm just going to say sexual immorality, yada, 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 AIDS. But you all get it, right? It's 1986. You know, you know. <laughs> 1986. I mean, the epidemic had basically just started, but it reached Tulsa and they said you get burnt. But I think he said get burnt by drunks. Oh, okay. And then alcohol. And then AIDS. I was like, wait a sec. He's getting burnt by drunks and AIDS. Oh, God really did a number on him. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then he goes, you know, he's like, but I think our generation is just like Jonah. At first, they didn't want to do what God says. And now they're being swallowed up in the giant fish of AIDS. And soon everybody will be a Christian again. I'm like, yeah, how'd that work out for you, man? Between 1986 <laughs> and now. Is there more Christians? Less Christians? <laughs> Um, I will note leering in the background of this rant was a mannequin that was fully dressed in a snowsuit. Yep. Did you notice that? I couldn't keep my eyes off of it. And it will never come to fruition. It will never matter. There's never a reason. <laughs> no, nope. it's just it's part of the skiing theme of the show. That was yeah. for Blaine's private time post shooting. <laughs> <laughs> we saw it before. Let's just he... say it wasn't dressed the whole time. <laughs> We saw it before he covered it in mayo. Ew. <laughs> There's also a moment in his little monologue where he says, don't turn Jesus off. <laughs> I don't quite <laughs> like that. Arch your back a little. He likes it when you arch your back. Ew. And just, let him, just let him finish inside of you. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't turn him off. And then he's gonna. He, now he's going to pray. He says, uh, if you've never received Jesus or if you're rebelling against God, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm pretty sure we're both. So I think Blaine prayed for us. <laughs> yep, that's fair. And his, his prayer is so fucked up because he basically says, dear God, please make them terrified enough to believe in my religion. Amen. Yep. And that's it. And then, of course, the second chapter of Acts is going to sing at us again. Uh-huh. Why does so much Christian music sound like marriage vows to Jesus? Oh my god, dude. I'm we're 30 seconds into this before I'm missing Blaine's summary of Jonah, right? <laughs> well, you know, you talked now about the segues. I thought this was the best segue. It was like fade out of like clockwork orange psycho rant and fade into <laughs> your teacher's show in the high school variety show <laughs> i love a good plastic beaded necklace you know they look like they just got permission to dress themselves and that's what they came up with <laughs> it's got like kind of like the weird logoed sweatshirt with a necklace over that and then she's got like a funny looking blazer with like a mismatched blouse and then like a floppy bow tie. <laughs> and then the other so woman rich. looks like if she looks like a little girl dressed up to be a school teacher. Yeah. OK. Yeah, there's definitely a, a we're wearing our parents clothes kind of a feel to everything <laughs> there. Yeah. Just a reminder. These literally are the clothes our parents died in. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> And I will say, I was paying a lot of attention to their clothes because it was physically impossible to pay attention to the lyrics and not fall asleep. Oh, this song is 855 minutes long. It's just that every second was twice as long as the previous second, <laughs> right? So it was this weird, like, going deeper in the dreams and inception kind of thing. There were three minutes left in this video for so long. <laughs> and you just watch it and you're like, I want to not be here anymore. Like, if, if I had to listen <laughs> to that song in church... All it would make me want to do is fuck around with my sisters in the pews and then go drink the actual fucking communion wine and then get AIDS and then the vicious cycle would happen and I have to listen to this music all over again. Get burned by a drunk. At me. <laughs> God, if you stay awake through this whole fucking song, a radio station should have to give you a new car or something. Yeah. Um, so... But if even the last note goes on and on and on. Oh. <laughs> and then and then right when you think you've made it out, he reminds you that he's going to ski against the indoor ski champion to close the show. This is fucking 
what is this scene? What is happening? I okay. So I see how you could think in your head that this would be a funny bit, right? So they've got the actual indoor skiing champion there. And, and they've got this little ramp that's like a foot and a half. And they're going to race down the ramp. Get it, Teehee? It's only a foot and a half. Right? I can see how in your head that seems funny. But what actually happens is they start doing it. Blaine gets so pissed off at the thought of possibly <laughs> losing to this woman that he basically just pushes her over and then <laughs> throw, throws himself down the fucking ramp. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then insists on doing a slow motion replay of him winning. And that is the end of the show. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But he, re he refers to himself in the third person. And there goes Bartle <laughs> down the slope. You're like, can't have it both ways. Well, I feel like what happened on set before this bit was that he tried to like finger her and she's like, stop it. What the fuck <laughs> oh, are you God. doing? <laughs> Jesus. Oh, yeah, well, I'm going to win this ramp race. <laughs> well, I tell yeah. you what, that would make the fact that she never takes off her mask and always stays like eight feet behind him make a lot more sense. <laughs> she wanted deniability if this show ever came out and good for her. <laughs> right. I really appreciate it. He, he, he said a couple times, I'm very capable in the sports area. Like, yes. <laughs> yes. The overcompensating line. Yes. That doesn't protest too much, Blade. <laughs> oh, God. And the whole thing ends with him going like, oh, by the way, here's our address. Write to us and tell us that you like me. <laughs> yeah, write us. Yeah. We, we won't read it, but okay, we need the I'll paper. He <laughs> <laughs> will totally read it. All right, well, I'll tell you what, Meg, I feel like, nailed the moral of this story when we talk about the Rebel Brothers skit. So I guess the only thing to close off on here uh, today is speculation about what kind of porn Blaine got addicted to. Any guesses on the genre? Ski coach humiliation reverse dominatrix porn. Nice. <laughs> nice. I would say... Um, the porn where you have to pretend that you're in an acting a class in prison <laughs> <laughs> and then they rape you <laughs> for all yeah, there's definitely <laughs> some prison rape in it i think i think you win meg i think actually yeah, you really? for sure <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. congratulations you get you know to, to never have to watch this shit again. Uh, speaking of which, Meg, I can't thank you enough. You've you you've come back for more and more than once on this thing now, and uh, and I'm amazed that you still do it. But I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. You guys are the best. Thank you for ruining my afternoon. Anytime. <laughs> and well, that's going to do it for our review of Fire by Night episode three. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to tantalize you for next week. So Eli, tell us what's on deck. The Omega Code, one of our most requested movies. I feel like we did that. We haven't done the Omega Code yet. Pretty sure we haven't done the Omega Code. Oh, wow. All right. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 260 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Meg for hanging out with us today. And a perhaps even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Idiot, Citation Needed, D&D &D Minus, and The Skeptocrat, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick. We will draft some Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosdick, I'm No Illusions. Promise to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. All of the young audience members grew up to organize the Trump rally in 2020 Tulsa, Oklahoma. Blaine Bartles went on to chop wood. Kid and family first never mattered. Nope. <laughs>
fucking Jennifer. <coughs> and he tried so he threw himself down that <laughs> he ramp. He really did. I can beat my girl on TV. <laughs> it was just embarrassing. <laughs> so embarrassing. It's like, the guy that, it's like the guy it's like the dad that shoves a kid in like the potato sack race yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly but the on comedy. television <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but on television <laughs> <laughs> all right an interstitial two <laughs> <laughs> got a christian skit comedy class that's gotta be hell Oh my God! I googled it. It's a real thing. <laughs> what? Oh, it is? It's Christian sketch comedy is uh, and Christian improv is Christian <gasps> improv class. I want to go by several mega churches, and they're doing Zoom classes right now. And there's <gasps> a big part of me that just wants to sign up. <laughs> oh my God! Well, that's like how they encourage everybody to buy a gun and be a member of the NRA, so you could take it down from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Whoa. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.